few people trying to get a mindset that's uh, established on the lure. That have happened to individuals. We talked about Joe. We talked about Paul. We talked about Noah last week. And this is a thought that came up. I heard it in a discussion. And I've kind of, I rattle it around in my brain every once in a while. And you come to the conclusion sometimes, why does God do this? Or why do these things have to happen? I've had people ask me that in the past. You know, why are these situations like they are? And going through and looking at Paul and looking at Job's life and looking at Noah's, I figured I'd pause for a moment instead of, continuing through looking at different people's lives and the impact that God had upon them to answer this question, why does God do this? Find with me 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And let me say as you're finding your place, we'll talk about the sovereignty of God sometime in the next several months, but do understand sometimes we do some things that bring stuff upon us. You with me? So tonight I'm not talking about the sinfulness. If I, if I commit a sin then, and I don't ask for repentance or try to get things right, naturally God's going to discipline me or ch chasten me to get me where I need to be. But what I want to talk about tonight is the trials, or as James calls them, the temptations, the trials that God causes upon our lives for a purpose. 1 Corinthians, I got you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. Find your place, please stand in honor of the reading of the Word of God. We'll start with this verse and then we'll jump to just a few others with one thought tonight. Why does God do this? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16 says, For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Father, I thank you for the word of God, Lord. Tonight I pray that you'd use this. Not my words, Lord, not my thoughts, but that your point and your uh, explanation would come through tonight clearly. Father, I know that we can't answer all of those questions tonight, but I pray that we would see really the, the foundation or the basic of this idea. Why do these trials or testings happen in my life? Why did these things have to happen to Job and happen to Noah and happened to Paul and certainly happened to people that are here tonight and all around the world, Lord. And I do see the truth here in Scripture that would help us to understand it, Father. Maybe it would help us in the future when those storms do happen in our life or we can be that support or that encouragement for others that have bad things that happen in their life, Lord. So I pray that you'd use me tonight, my hands, my voice, that everything would be clear tonight, Lord, that you'd encourage us and just give us what we need, Father. Let me say thank you for your love to us. Thank you for salvation. Father, there's truthfully nothing better than that, knowing one day that when we die and we leave out of this earth, we're going to be in heaven and forever with you. Lord, until that happens, you tell us that we do have the mind of Christ. We got the word of God that you've given to us. So let us dig down and see what's here, Lord, that we can make application to in our lives. Thank you for everyone that's here. Bless them. In a special way, please, Holy Spirit of God, lead us and teach us. We ask it in Christ's name, Jesus' name I pray. Amen, amen. Appreciate you standing. You can be seated. So I've already said that we've looked at a few people's lives who've had, we could say, a bad lot that's happened to them during their time of living. Uh, you could say that they've had some serious heartaches or trials and tribulations that are happened to them or losses. And we could come to the place of saying why. And let me just tell you in the beginning before we get right into this is that it's, it's okay to say, Lord, why is this happening? What's up? It's not okay to argue with the Lord, but it's all right to try to figure out why he's permitting these things to happen or that testing to happen in your life because he has a purpose. And it's all right to say, hey, why? Can you please show me? Because we want to learn and get closer with the Lord and Truthfully, that's the whole point on these reasons uh, of these situations that happen in our life is that it does bring us closer with the Lord. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, I know that it's a memorized verse. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. Uh, we like to look at that and say, okay, everything's going to be good. But please understand it's good 
according to God's design. It's not good to the way that I come up with. And he knows me and he knows you better than you know yourself and I know myself. God knows what we need to change, uh, to be tried, to be tested in our life so that at the end of that thing we can be better for him. He knows the people that we'll meet. He knows the people that we can encourage. He knows the people that we could challenge. He knows what we need in our life to get us out of that rut, if you could say it that way, or out of our comfort zone so that we can move forward and more glorify God. And that's his work in us. And who are we to say, well, well, well stop that, Lord. But really we should be saying, okay, show me so that I can get through that. So understand that verse is saying that, yes, it's good for the glory of God. It'd be hard for me to stand here and say, I'm sure that Job, when he woke up that morning and lost his entire family and lost everything, would say, woohoo, this is good. But in the end, there's a lot that's taught to us through his situation, right, that we've learned and know. We can know how to get through crisis, and we can know how to resolve uh, and learn more about patience because of what happened to Job. And we can see the hand of God upon him. So it's not always for our good. It could be for the good of other people, but it does come together for the good of God. And we need to remember that as we go through this life, and it's for his purpose. Now, here we see in the scripture an interesting phrase that says, but we have the mind of Christ. So what are some examples of that? Well, if you back up to verse 10, we can begin to figure out to see what Paul is saying. It's not that we're saved and automatically we have this supernatural thing that God gives to us. There is a Holy Spirit of God that's within us, right, that leads us and helps us and encourages us and warns us and opens our eyes, but we have to work and do to discover what he's talking about. We don't just automatically get saved and we have the mind of Christ. So there is a specific thing that he's leading us to, if you look in verse 10, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. So what's he talking about? The Spirit of God is talking, I'm sorry, Paul is pinning down that the Spirit of God is going to show us. Now let me just say it this way, to help us to understand what the Scripture says. God has given us plenty of tools, if you will, right? You got the church, you got the pastor, you got teachers. Uh, you're able to think, you're able to have eyes to read, you're able to wonder and consider things that are happening and ask questions, right? You have these opportunities, these tools that God has given to you. And he says here that it's the Spirit of God that opens or illuminates our eyes to truth. It opens our eyes to help us to understand. Verse 14 says, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. You know, so I'm saying a person can read the Bible and see the history things that are there and the names that are there, but the deep things, the spiritual things that are revealed through the scripture, the Holy Spirit of God is the one that's giving us that. You understand? That's why there's a difference of these people that write these books and they give their ideas compared to what the word of God is saying. We are trusting the Holy Spirit of God to show us these truths for a purpose of application to our life, a change in our lives. We have that blessed leading, that blessed opening of eyes, if you will, that the Lord God has given to us. And that is what he's talking about here as the mind of Christ. In other words, we understand, we know, we believe, we agree with that fact that Jesus Christ had to die in our place. Right? We read that, we see that, we understand that because the Spirit of God shows that to us. That would be the mind of Christ. Jesus Christ knew that he was going to become our Savior. And we understand that the Scripture is telling us he had to die in my place. Mind of Christ. Let me give you another example. The Bible says, uh, we understand, know, and believe, and agree with the fact of the Trinity. Right? That they're all co-equal, making the essence of God. And Jesus Christ himself told us what? My Father and I are one. So we understand what he's saying. 
In other words, we have the mind of Christ. We understand what the Word of God is teaching to us. Uh, another one is uh, we understand and know and believe and agree that what the world will hate us. And how do we know that? Because Jesus Christ taught us and recorded it down that understand the world hated me first, therefore it's going to hate you. What I'm saying is we can understand what's being said that happened to people that have been recorded down in Scripture. We see that, we understand that, that gives us, if you will, the mind of Christ. Now please understand it's partial right now, completed as the word of God that he's given to us, but one day in the future, what does it say? We shall be like him, and it also says that we shall be forever with him. So that would be, if you will, the completed version of what's going to happen, because there are many things that have not been recorded down in scripture. He says himself, if everything had been recorded down, the world could not even contain how many books that would be. So there's much of what we don't know, but what he wants us to know, he's given to us in Scripture. So you and I can have the mind of Christ. We can think as he's taught us here in Scripture to think. We can have that. It's our choice. So having the mind of Christ is knowing and understanding what he says and been recorded down for us. Now, I said all of that for one point tonight that I've told you. Why does God do this? I can't answer why things happen in people's lives, except one thing, God's growing us. He's testing us. He's trying us. Those are the answers. I can't explain why a child passes away. I can't explain why a, a, a wife would leave or a person dies or, I mean, I understand sin and all of those things, but what I'm saying is it's very difficult for us sometimes to understand why God does these things in my life. Why do I have to go through these crises, if you will? Go with me to James chapter 1 tonight. James chapter 1. And I know I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. If you forget or you don't pay attention to anything I say from this point on, understand testing is to develop contentment in our life. It's to develop contentment in our life. James chapter 1, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. He says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. That would be testing. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. We always tease when people say, hey, pray for me that my patience would be better. I'm going to say, no, 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 no. <laughs> don't pray for that. <laughs> that means you're going to have some trials and temptations happen in your life. Don't pray for that because that's what God uses in our life to help us with patience is testing. Verse 4, he says, But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect, entire, and here it is, wanting nothing. If I were to say, what is contentment to you? I'm sure we'd have a variation of different answers. It could just be peace in my relationship. It could be the you know, blessings to see my children develop and be successful in life. It could be that I would stop searching for the next dollar. It could be that uh, I catch the biggest fish, right? I, there's different responses. Terry just looked at me, so I was thinking Florida. <laughs> Right, there would be different answers for what gives us contentment, right? But here James says, God's going to give you <laughs> trials so that you can have contentment. You know what God wants? Us to completely rely upon him. That's contentment. That's contentment. When we say, you know what, it doesn't matter what happens here with our government or with politics or our town or 
this situation or that situation. What matters is that I'm looking and depending upon you to give me what I need. And when I rely, depend upon him, contentment. When I know that he knows what's best for me, contentment. When I know that he's willing to provide for me, contentment. When I know that he knows that I'm in the middle of this storm, contentment. You understand what I'm saying? Contentment is the reason he gives us trials. I don't know if you read the whole book of Job or not, but uh, when you look at the conversation with his <laughs> friends who criticize him and are negative to him and really blame shifting on him, he goes through those things and says in the end of this thing, really said in the beginning, hey, if God slay me, good to go. That was my version. But he said, if God kills me, naked I came, naked I go. Contentment. Job knew that God was going to give him what he needed. So the short answer for why does God do this is that we would develop contentment. But there's one more blessing that we see, verse 12. Look at this. He says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation trials, for when he is tried he shall receive what? The crown of life. There's only five crowns that will be given. Really, there's four to the individual because one of the crowns goes to pastors in the world. So there's four possibilities of crowns that an individual can receive. And he says, if you're willing to endure trials and tribulations, you will receive a crown of life when Jesus Christ comes back. So two things that we see is contentment and a crown. What a blessing. Hold your place and look with me in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Paul was one of the men that we talked about, and I want you to look at what it says here in verse 11. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. He says, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned. In whatsoever state I am there with to be what? Content. What's Paul saying? I learned it. I learned it. Hmm. How'd you learn it, Paul? I went through some hard not lives. I had to go to jail. I had to go and be beat, and I had to go and be persecuted, and I had to go and preach and be criticized, and I had to continue to follow the will of God, and people would forsake me. I would get to the end of the place in my life, and I would say, where are all the people they've left me? There are just a few left that are with me. I would have to go to the place to be beheaded. Paul would say, I would continue enduring life, and through every situation I learned more and more and more and more what? Dependence upon God that he can say, now I've learned to be content. I've learned to be content. Go back to James, three things I want you to see. He says here, number one, through this building process or learning to be content so that we can arrive to the place of contentment. Can I say, when we learn through these trials and tribulations, you can be, quote unquote, happy in every situation. Why? Because he provides the joy. He provides what's needed. He provides the foundation. So we can learn to be happy in every situation of trials and tribulations. I know it sounds crazy, but it's true. But look, number one, how we can receive this help in this life. How do we understand that? Recognize that God is in this plan. If you notice in verse 1 and verse 2, it says, James, a servant of God... And he's writing this letter to who? My brethren. Well, who are they? The children of God. Who are they? They're his children. They're his servants. They're his people. God knows where you're at. God knows what you need. God's there to provide for you. You're going to see in just a minute, he's not going to give you so much that you can't even bear it. God designed this and he's watching over you to provide for you what's needed. So during your trial... At the same time that it's happening, remember he knows. 
He's provided. And he has a perfect will and a perfect purpose. And I'm just going to tell you, the sooner you stop fighting against it, the quicker you'll see contentment. Two years, I fought and fought and fought and fought and fought and fought against my calling. It was in 2011. He put it on my heart. And I said, hold on, God. I can do 30 years in the Marine Corps and still serve you. I can stay right here and live in North Carolina and still serve you. I got a good church here. I can still serve you. And me and God had this debate. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you, it didn't go good. <laughs> but I'm hard-headed, as many of you know. And it took me two years to finally say, okay, Lord, I surrender. I submit to your calling. And then God will let that process come along good. The sooner we yield, the sooner that trial and tribulation will come to the end. And you can have contentment. So recognize that God is in this trial. Number two, he says, this is the crazy one, verse two, count it all joy. So I can have joy in the middle of a testing, yep. The, the loss of a life or the impact of a loss of a job or the impact of a financial situation or the impact of a relationship that breaks, the hardships of life. You're telling me I can find joy and God says, yeah, I'm with you. I'm right there with you. I will give you what you need if you will just but trust me. That's what he's saying. You count it as joy. Now, when you think about that, God's given me this thing. That means God's thinking about me. I don't know. There's probably 45, 50 people here. And God thinks about every one of you, let alone in the 13 billion people that's in this world. If he gives you a trial, <laughs> oh, God help me. You should say, praise the Lord. You're thinking of me. You want me to make some changes in my life. You want me to be more dependent upon you. You want to make me something better and special for you. It's a hard one, I know that. <laughs> but recognize God's with us and find joy in the middle of that testing process. If we know that God is in it, then we will learn to depend upon him to get through that. The sooner we find that, patience comes to a completion and we have contentment. Please understand that God is working on our patience. The third thing that we see that James is saying is we realize that the trial is provided to result in you having contentment. Content in the situation. Content with what God has given you. We know that God is enough. We say that all the time. But in the middle of our testing, do we truly believe that God is enough? Do we truly trust that God is enough? In the end, we want to be what God wants us to be. I hope that we would all say that. And sometimes those lessons are easy. Sometimes those lessons are hard. Sometimes it's easy for us to surrender those things, and sometimes it's hard for us to surrender those things. I mean, you think about the example of Isaac going up there to get killed, right? I mean, you think that his dad was... Super excited about offering his son there? No, of course he wasn't. But God wanted to see and get him to the place that says, hey, trust me. Have contentment in me. And as he walked up that hill, I know he had to because he said it. He's thinking in the back of his mind. If he dies, God's going to give me another. If he dies, God's going to bring him back alive again. Therefore, I'm just going to trust God. I mean, there's no better illustration than that. Trust him. Let him work in me. Let me be satisfied with God. Let me do what God wants me to do. So as this process is happening in my life, and he's changing me to make him more like him, I can learn to be content in him. So James gives us some things that show us how we develop our patience and contentment, and how we can receive a crown of life. Again, and we know that all things work together for good, that's to God, to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. He gets to determine that good in our life. Here's the positive, I guess. All of that's positive. <laughs> but look in 1 Corinthians chapter 10.
1 Corinthians chapter 10. It's a good verse to memorize. You say, why is that? Because the storms of life happen. This is a good verse to memorize. You say, why is that? Because trials are going to happen in your life. Tribulations are going to happen in your life. And when they do, you've got to look to him. You have to. Thank God we have brothers and sisters in Christ to support and encourage one another. But please understand the trial and the situation is happening because God wants you to look to him. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation, test and taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to. To bear it. So what does that mean? When Job lost everything in one day, do you realize? Let's look at the positive side of this. Do you realize God looked down and said, he, he can handle that. He can handle that. I know that if he loses everything, he's going to be good. I know that if you continue to touch his body and remove his health, he's still going to be good. God knew that about Job. Well, that's a positive thing to think about. Now, we don't want to go through that. We don't want to suffer that. But understand, God, look, because you remember the discussion with Satan. Hmm, have you considered Job a just, righteous man? Take everything that he has, but don't touch his body. One day it's gone. Hey, have you considered Job a righteous man? Don't kill him, but you can touch his body and remove his health. Noah, in the midst of a world full of evil and unrighteousness, where it said every heart imagined evil. In the next verse, what's it say? And he found grace. Noah found grace in the midst of evil. There was one man and seven family members that God looked down upon in the entire world and said, he's going to go. Hey, why don't you build me an ark? A boat? No rain? A flood? Good to go, God. I'll build it. And he builds the ark. And he's a preacher of righteousness. Surely people were criticizing and mocking him. Surely people were against him. What do you do? Kept going. Wow. God saw Noah and said, he can do it. He can bear my load. There's some positives In the midst of these trials and tribulations, God sees enough to know that you can handle it. He knows that you know enough to look to him. He knows that you should have the mind of Christ to be able to pick the right path out of that testing process. So there's some good things that we see, some positives, if you will, that God's looking down and seeing them. And he says right here, the promise is that he's not going to give you so much that there's not a right way out. Nor did he say, I'm going to give it to you and forsake you. Nor did he say, I'm going to give it to you and hope that it crushes you. I'm going to give it to you so that it destroys you. No, God says, I'm giving you this because I know that you're able to choose right. Now, sometimes we don't. We fall. We get right back up. We dust off. We ask for repentance. And we get right back in the race. We get right back in the line. But sometimes we choose right. Praise the Lord. Yeah, it hurts. But in the end, as Job says, we come forth as what? Gold. We're pure. We're better. And it might not be even for our purpose. It could be for the purpose of helping our kids. It could be for the purpose of helping another church member. It could be for the purpose of helping our neighbor. It could be for the purpose of proclaiming the gospel in our joyful life as we went through that trial and tribulation. I don't know, but I know he knows. And he'll give you what's needed to get through that lesson, if you will, that tribulation. There's always a right way according to that verse. We have to learn to choose right. Can I say it this way? Look at that trial and tribulation and pick what he says that matches up to the mind of Christ. So how does that happen? Well, how do we learn to choose right? How do we learn patience? How do we learn contentment so that we can receive that crown of life? Are they easy lessons? No, 
Sometimes they're very difficult. But they're not more than we can bear, God says. We use the word of God. We use the people of God to help us to understand so that we can line up with maybe it was the example that Christ, when he walked on this earth, maybe it was the example of another man or woman of God that lived and went through that trial and tribulation. But ultimately, the result in the end is that we look to him. Job proved the sincerity of his love for God over everything. Everything. Everything in life had to offer, everything that finances had to offer. Job lost it all, and he still loved God. He endured for several days, teaching us what? Patience. We say the patience of Job, right? We say, if he can endure that, then we can learn from him to endure that in our lives. And thank God, we may not be ready to lose everything. Maybe it's one thing. Maybe it's just another, uh, I don't know, luxury, luxury in life that God might take away. But we can look at Job in his life and say, ah, that's how we're to get through crisis. That's how we're to learn how to have patience in our lives. That's how we are to learn that God is enough in everything that we need to have contentment. Noah proved that trusting God and his word is enough. God said, build the ark. He said, all right. And God provided everything he needed. I don't even know if Noah was a carpenter. I don't even know he knew the first thing about cutting wood. Surely he didn't know nothing about building a boat. But God said it. He said, good to go. I'm in. Proving trust. In the midst of a situation of an awful world. So we can learn how to push through adversity. And we can understand that when people forsake us, we're still going to be okay. And we can understand that we need to be taking care of our family. And we can understand that God's going to provide for us. That was the lesson in his life that we get to read. Paul proved that we can serve during any situation, any political climate. He proved that we can serve through that. You say, how is that? Because it's been recorded down that he continued to preach no matter when he was jailed, beaten, persecuted, and later to be killed. But he recorded down for us that any situation or circumstance doesn't have to control our life. We can respond in a way That edifies God. And we can proclaim his word in the name of Jesus Christ no matter what. Now listen, that's only three. And as the Lord leads, we're going to look at others. And when we started this thing three weeks ago, we were talking about what is our mindset? What is our mindset? If our mind is with and on Christ, we can see why he's doing these things. Recognize he sees me recognize he's here to support me, recognize he's here to help me through this situation to make me better. But So many times we look at the trial and tribulation, we say, boy, this is negative, why me? And we don't see none of that in these men's lives that we've seen. Bush basically said what James said, (laughs) praise the Lord that you'd count me worthy to go through these trials and tribulations. I mean, you understand that they've been put down for years to come till Jesus Christ comes back, that we're reading their lessons to make application to our life. So why does God do this? Short answer, to make us more dependent upon him, really to have contentment, and you could say the blessing of receiving a crown of life. This is why James can say, count it all joy, because it brings us closer to God the one we say that we love, the one that we say we know, the one we say we want or have a relationship with. Well, sometimes he might put us through the ringer to help us to understand how we need to get closer with him. And here's the promise. It's going to result in good for him. Might not feel good for you, but in the end, the result can be some encouragement for another person but it will bring you to the place of contentment. 
Wouldn't it be wonderful if we truly had contentment? If we weren't just so moved around and up and down and all over with our feelings and our emotions, if we just had some contentment saying, you know what? God's going to get us through this. I jokingly said, I don't know, a month or two months ago, I've lived through several antichrists because they said that every president was the new antichrist. And I'm still here. <laughs> there's been some Republicans, there's been some Democrats, and guess what? We're still here, right? We're still here. And I'm not dismissing the things that we're losing, I understand that. But what I'm just trying to say is, he knows. He knows. And he's going to give us everything that we need to get through it. He's not going to stop with you. He gave it to Job. He gave it to Noah. He gave it to Abraham. Boy, you can just keep going on down the list. He gave it to the apostles. He gave it to Paul. He gave it to Timothy. He gave it to you. And he gave it to me. He's the same God. The sooner we learn to be content, depend upon him, understanding the trials and tribulations are for a purpose to bring us closer with him, the sooner they'll end. And we should say, wow, thank you, God, that you think that I can bear this load. Thank you, God, that you're making me more like you. There's positive ways to look at trials and tribulations. They're not always negative. Contentment, dependency upon the Lord is what God wants from you. So why does God do this? Well, one of the things we see, contentment, dependency, and the blessing of a crown one day, the crown of life. Thank God for lessons. Thank God that he's with us through these things. Father, we thank you so much for the word of God, Lord, how true it is. There's nobody that says, boy, Lord, send me another trial and tribulation. Why is that? Because we think about self. Lord, as I stand here, I don't want to say, hey, Give me some more struggles in my life and, 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 and make some things difficult in my life that I would be closer to you. I'd prefer to say, hey, Lord, why don't you just convict me and I'll, I'll look to you, Lord, and make changes in my life. But why is that? Because my mindset is not upon you. If my mindset was upon you, I would say, hey, Lord, whatever you want, I want. Whatever you need to make me be more like you, whatever you need to change in my life, whatever you see that... Uh, needs development in my life. Hey, I'm willing, Lord, and I know that you'll give me an escape route, and I know that you'll give me the strength, and I know that you'll give me at the end of this thing contentment because I can trust upon you, Lord. And I've seen you answer all throughout the scripture. You blessed, you took care of, you blessed, you took care of. Lord, you're not a God that can lie. You're perfect, holy, and righteous, Lord. So we're asking you to help us. Help us, God, to see the reason you do it is to make us to be content and dependent upon you. Lord, I don't know right now who's going through situations or who will tomorrow or who will from a week from now, but I do know that according to your scripture, you'll give us only what you know we can handle and you'll give us something to make us more like you. So Lord, when that happens, help us to look to you to count it as joy, to receive the commitment, uh, to contentment, and that our patience would develop, Lord. I pray that you'd bless. I pray that you'd speak to hearts. Lord, maybe there's a person here that's not sure about salvation. Lord, the only way to have contentment in this world is to know Jesus Christ. The only way to have peace in this world is to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The only way to know for sure that you're going to heaven and have that hope and that rest is knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. doesn't matter if another person's been saved in your family. doesn't matter how much you read the Word of God. What matters is have you trusted in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray if anyone is doubting that, you'd convict their heart and that they would understand their need of salvation, Lord. Those of us that are saved, Lord, maybe we just come and say thank you. Maybe we just come and say, Lord, help strengthen me. Help me to be that light. Help me to be that glory for you, Lord. Help me to understand what these truths are saying. I want to depend upon you. I want contentment. 
Father, whatever's needed in the heart of your people, your children, Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit of God, lead, convict, that they come forth and get things right with you, Lord. Help us as we take some time and talk with you through prayer, Lord, that you would provide, answer, convict, encourage, whatever it is, Lord, and we'd be bold to respond. You bless the invitation, please, we ask. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, the invitation, the altar's open. If you need to come and pray, you can. If you want to stay right there, that's fine. Talk to the Lord, the one that loves you and wants to provide you with contentment.